And today I went outside just for a quick walk and I didn't have a mask on and I had anxiety. So like, it's almost like conditioned society now to have a mask. Like everyone has to have a mask on. It's so weird. It's kind of like yeah. in the old days, like everyone like wore like these big bonnets and stuff like that. That's going to be like the new fashion accessory. You have to have a mask or you're not going to feel yourself anymore. You know what? Um, what I hope bare minimum happens is that during flu season, when other people know that they've got the flu or they got the cold or something like that, or they got some sort of a bug, uh, because, you know, obviously the thing that was drilled into uh, everybody's minds in the beginning of this pandemic uh, in America was that masks prevent you from spreading it. That doesn't prevent you from catching it. Now, obviously we know that that was not true. And maybe, you know, the reason that they were saying that was because there wasn't enough mask supply anyway. So what's the use in telling everybody to wear a mask? But at bare minimum, there should be a lot more awareness about when you wear a mask, you're capturing your bacteria. And so I hope it creates a more a socially responsible society where when people are sick, They'll put a mask on so that they can protect other people. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if it's wishful thinking, but dude, I'll tell happen. you, man. Um, you know, I lived in China for a few years, and then when I came to America, I, my biggest memory, like the first week of school, I remember I was in fifth grade, right? In fifth grade in America, none of the kids washed their hands before eating at lunch. And I, I'd be like, and the teachers wouldn't even allow us to go to the bathroom beforehand. So like I was like the OCD kid. Like I would have a napkin and like, you know create a barrier between my hands and the food and everyone's like jay everything's clean why are you like because you know for those two and a half years if i didn't wash my hands before a meal i'd probably get sick or something like that you know this was 90 china very different china but like that's that's why it was ingrained in me like hygiene habits right i i, I read some statistic that before the lockdown before like america got conscious about safety and health habits again i think 40 percent of men after using a public restroom didn't wash their hands yeah i've seen stats like that it, it's, it's yeah it's pretty scary I, I hope that um i think every country uh could deal could could uh, uh benefit from upgrading their kind of hygiene uh, standards and uh a thought process i mean even here in china you know they're uh my kids school now they've changed all of their soap dispensers to automatic soap dispensers. That's you don't have good. to touch them anymore. You know, I think these are the changes we're going to see. I think uh, some of these uh, really basic things, um, more automated, you know, non-touch sinks where you don't have to touch. Uh, it, there's going to be a huge boost in that business uh, yeah. for sure. Um, and I really hope um, one day Americans learn the squat posture too. You know, public restrooms, <laughs> it's better to squat, right? You don't have your, your butt doesn't have to touch anything. Foreigners have a problem doing the, the squat. You know, they, yeah, they, yeah. they're not used to it. But l let me tell you, when when you go to a, uh, a metro station or, a you know, some sort of – like you're thankful for the, the for, for having that option here. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Your body doesn't have to touch anything. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean – yeah, it, it, as 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 uncomfortable as a, of a position it is. First of all, it's actually better for your body. It's yeah. way better for your digestion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for 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 everything. Um, yeah. But then, in terms of the hygiene side of things, yeah. Who knows? Maybe we're going to start seeing. Uh, we're not going to see them, but that would be a you know it, it, this could be the catalyst to start seeing squat toilets in the U.S. Yeah. Where you, you, know? you know, very funny story. Um, when I was in college, there was a company that tried to bring squat toilets over to America and it failed. It was called blue earth ceramics or something like that. I don't know if they're, I don't know if their website still up, but like they failed after a few years because like, you know, nobody found a need, right? Besides a few health conscious people, a few yoga people potentially who are like, Oh yeah. Um, I'm actually, I'll put it, I'll, I'll send it to you so you can share it with people if you, if you wanted to, but like, you know, sure. besides a few health conscious people, a few yoga people, maybe a few, few people who grew up in Africa or Asia who like the squat position, people are like, what's the point of this, right? Aren't you going to fall into the bowl? But, <laughs> but it's like, um, um, I think, like you said, I think now more, if they started this company now, you might actually be able to like, they might actually not be able to go under. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this is the company, uh, facebook.com Beck, uh, Beck sell. That's the one. Yeah, Blue Earth Ceramics. I put it in your, in your chat. Yeah, yeah, I put it on the screen. I put yeah. it on the screen. Nice. Um, wow. That, okay. That's, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, they that, tried, they tried, you know, 
there's merit. There's merit to it. I mean, um, yeah. You did that company that came out. What was it called? The Squatty Potty. Did you see that? The the commercial yes, for the yes. Squatty I potty? interviewed them back in the day, but you know, their whole thing is like you just put your foot up, but then eventually you'll realize, yeah, well, you can actually do more, and you don't just put your foot up. But that's a good start. I got my roommate to put his foot up. We have something called the Lily Pad. If you guys are familiar with the lily pad, so the lily pad, you can squat all the way or you can put your foot up. So my roommates have gone to the point where they can put their foot up. Of course, I squat all the way on the lily pad. So, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, – I could go on for hours about this. I've actually – when I applied for college, I wrote an essay like this as a joke just to see, just to see if I could get away with it. So uh, to explain to you what's happening here in China in terms of uh, toilets, and now we're on the to uh, toilet topic – um, mm -hmm. When you have new homes being renovated in the cities here, uh, they're pretty much not. Nobody's putting squat toilets in anymore. If oh, you're uh, if you're in like third tier cities, fourth, you know that that kind of range, they're still renovating new homes with squat toilets, but they're gone from the city. But mm -hmm. you know what? At home, it, that's that's maybe maybe it's okay. Uh, the, for the public washrooms, you're seeing more of the new shopping malls that are being built, where they have maybe like if they have six stalls. Maybe four of them will be uh, traditional Western toilets, and two of them will be uh, squat toilets. So they still mm -hmm. have them. And there's still a lot of people that will prefer them. Like those will be the ones that are taken before the ones that have the Western toilets. So, yeah, it's kind of a, like a middle ground right now. I hope yeah. they don't go all the way. I yeah, hope they, I hope they don't go all the way either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because um, it has its uh, it, it it has its benefits. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe that could be a business idea for me. I will start yeah. getting people to install squat toilets in their so home. business idea, let me tell you what you got to really – so that that's maybe uh, – it's a little bit of a, a, a more difficult sell. But yeah. anything to do with uh, automation of hygiene, so automatic um, soap dispensers, um, automatic sink. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of places, facilities will want to upgrade their taps if you actually have to physically touch the taps mm. uh, to, to automated options. Um Anything to do with that. Uh, I think that uh, after the pandemic, because this is my prediction, which I hope I'm really wrong about, but I think um, America is going to try to open a lot sooner than they need to, than they should in terms of uh, uh, when there's a pandemic around. And I understand there's other uh, co legitimate concerns about the economy. And it's like, how is this even sustainable to stay shut this long? I don't even know how we did it here. We were shut down for two, three months. My, my brew pub was closed, completely closed for a couple of months. Um, the only relief we got so far was uh, the government gave us some subsidies on the uh, utilities and uh, the landlord gave us one month uh, free rent. Mm -hmm. But that period of time was so crucial to get down to a point where we had at least a 14 day period where there were very limited new cases. So I think America's gonna open up because they have to. It's a difficult thing to stay shut. Um, and, and which is something they should appreciate that what China did when they actually shut down their economy like this for two months. Um, and there's going to be a huge spike in cases again. There's going to be a lot of people dying. Uh, and again, that's why I hope I'm wrong, but there'll be a lot of people dying. And all of a sudden people are going to want to do whatever they can to uh, upgrade their facilities or think about how they can um, implement processes that will limit the spread of this one of those things is going to be thermometers you know just like here every single business um when you come in the wireless thermometers you check their temperature beep 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 if you have a if, if you have a business and you're open and people are dying all around you and somebody has a fever you're not going to let them into your shop and in order to uh facilitate that you're going to need uh wireless uh you're going to need wireless thermometers also these are all big uh, big opportunities big business opportunities Mm, all right. Okay. Um, the other thing for people watching from the West, Amazon Live is really taking off. So for those of you who've ever want to be like Billy Mays, hey, Billy Mays here, you got a chance to go on Amazon Live. So I see that as something because people are realizing how much potential Amazon has to sell stuff. So, you know, they need those infomercial type guys. And I see people on Amazon doing that stuff now. Of course, China's That's been doing amazing. that for years. I didn't years. know they were doing that. Yeah, yeah they, Amazon they, they, Live. They, Check it out. Amazon Live. They've been Live. doing that for a while in China, as you yeah. probably know. And they had a really big one recently with um, with celebrities. Mm -hmm. with celebrities doing the live sales and stuff like that. Um, 
but uh, that's interesting. I didn't know. I didn't know that existed. Yeah, I, I didn't know until this thing started. And then I was, you know, I'm always trying to look at opportunities. And then someone told me about, yeah, people are selling things on Amazon. I'm like, and I had to, it's hard to find it too. Like I, I had to like search for a while before I found it. And then I went on the Amazon live page and like just salespeople all over. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. You know, as YouTube and stuff like that, you know, YouTube, I, I don't think ever is going to get e-commerce integrated. So it looks like it's giving other platforms room to kind of like poach a lot of this user base. Some users want to be able to like watch in a more sales type of environment. You know, some users want to watch in other type of ways, but it's like uh, YouTube doesn't have that e-commerce integration. All they have is like the T-shirt integration, but that's different. That's not like, you know, I can't I can't buy this on YouTube, right, if I wanted to. Yeah. You know, that that is um, it seems like a massive uh, missed opportunity on the part of Google, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, they have totally. Google shopping. They have price comparison websites. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just makes sense. Like uh, WeChat already has complete ecosystems where you don't need to even leave WeChat to buy yeah. things or to buy from influencers and things like that. Yeah. To even have membership cards like our, our brew pub, the Taps brew pub here. Our membership cards, it's all on WeChat. It's on the WeChat system. Wow. They, uh, yeah, they don't they don't need to leave WeChat to use their member card to pay for their beer with their balance that they have on their TAPS member card. It's like, um, it's just, I don't know why it's so slow in the West when, when we were always, you know, the innovators in the West. Why it's yeah. so slow to pick up on some of this stuff. It's, yeah. it's, really, it's really quite I weird. I remember, yeah. so... Um, when I started at Bite Dance, right, I, I even resisted going back to China to, to visit the home office in Beijing because I was like, ah, I mean, America's got everything. What's what's the, what's the deal? But then when I went back to China, I was legitimately surprised. Like I was still paying in cash in Beijing and everyone was looking at me funny because you know, <laughs> nobody paid in cash. And I was like, wow, you know, this is interesting. Now, you know, there's, there's arguments for why you pay in cash and stuff like that. We're not going to go into that. But the point is like, the technology integration wasn't even there in America. Yeah. I mean, we had Apple Pay and, you know, some people had the PayPal app and stuff like that. But it wasn't like you can go into any store and use Apple Pay or PayPal or Venmo, you know, it, literally anywhere in China, even cities outside of Beijing, you can still pay in cash. But like any place, you, even a fruit vendor on the street, right, you can you can pay the fruit vendor uh, in WeChat or Alipay. It's, yeah. it's like. Oh, you can, yeah. you can, the homeless people accept uh, WeChat. Also. The homeless people <laughs> accept WeChat yeah. donations. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen, I got to tell you, I haven't seen a homeless person in Shenzhen for like eight years. I'm sure there still are, but like, you, you know, you, you, back before, you know, in Futian district, you used to see a bunch of them and stuff like that. But it's really, it's really developed a lot here in that sense too. But in terms of payment technologies, um, there's obviously the e rem and b coming soon too i don't know if you know that they're going oh, big tell me about it i don't know about yeah. this yeah they're so they're they're going big on uh, blockchain technology and there's going to be a digital version of the rem and b uh, which is on the blockchain so it's not a blockchain yeah it's not a blockchain in the traditional sense where it is a, a, a totally decentralized um there still will be central controls in beijing but it will be a public ledger um it will be completely transparent and uh, i think it will uh I think it will act as potentially a new way to se uh, settle uh, uh, um, uh, global transactions. Yeah. And, yeah. and people have been looking for an alternative uh, to the U.S. dollar for a long time. Yeah. You know, the, the European Union and, and the main problem is, you know, the U.S. dollar has been almost like a public service to the world. It is that people trust the U.S. dollar. People trust the U.S. government. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, uh, more and more they've been weaponizing uh, the U.S. dollar, you know, with their sanctions and stuff like that, um, threatening other countries. So even though they were the only ones to walk away from the what is it, the GC, GCOP deal, whatever it is, I can't remember the abbreviation with Iran um, and the other European nations, they were saying, uh, we have a written signed agreement here where we can't walk away from this. So when the U.S. stopped uh, trade with Iran again, walked away from the deal and European countries were dealing with Iran in US dollars, the US technically could prosecute those uh, European banks. And they did, they've, they've sued them for billions of dollars. Um, and so what they did was they set up an alternate currency settlement system called uh, Intex or something like that. Um, it hasn't really taken off, but the point is, is that there are people looking for alternatives uh, to the US dollar for global settlements. And the e b might be one of them. And you know what? 
um, Facebook. Uh, oh, geez, what's Facebook CEO's name? What's his name? The robotic guy. Zuckerberg. Uh, Zuckerberg. I can't believe I forgot his name. I'm so bad with names. Even even Mark Zuckerberg's name, I forget. So Zuckerberg, he was on to something with Libra. So he was going to do the Libra uh, blockchain digital currency, and it was going to be pegged to multiple global currencies. Um, it was a brilliant idea. It was perfect. But he got blasted so badly by um, uh, U.S. Congress. Like he, he got pulled in and he had to answer all sorts of questions. And after that point, uh, Visa and all of these other big players who were involved in Libra, they started saying, I think we're going to back out of this. They basically crushed uh, that innovation. Um, and I think there is an unwritten rule also that y you don't mess around with the U.S. dollar. You don't do anything that's going to challenge the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, uh, that is the source of so much of America's power. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of conspiracy theories around, you know, JFK because he was one of the first people to challenge the Federal Reserve, and also Gaddafi in Libya. He was the one who wanted to. I mean, that was the richest um, uh, African uh, nation until uh, they had the regime change, and they were working on an African currency also, which would have been gold backed. Because as you know, the U.S. dollar hasn't been gold backed for a long time, exactly. and so that would have been something tangible that could have potentially competed with. Uh, the U.S. dollar, especially in such an emerging area of the world. Wow. Um, but now what you do is you don't have America doesn't have the same capability to come into China and just regime change the government before they launch this uh, e-renminbi blockchain uh, currency. And so it creates a lot of uh, interesting questions um, about what we're going to see in the future in terms of that. I have some comments coming in saying things like USD means unlimited printing without consequences. And I more or less agree with that uh, with some limitations. It has very limited short-term consequences. All of these other countries that are um, struggling with uh, this pandemic and uh, economic issues, they can't just freely print money uh, with limited short-term consequences like the US is. But you, know, you guys in the US, you're printing a lot of money right now. And it's, it's it, that's going to be the other thing, other than the weaponization of the U.S. dollar, the um, uh, the mass kind of printing of it is going to be something that really shakes up the uh, the the, uh, the global economy as well. So there should yeah. be some interesting things developing there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've the all those conspiracies and stuff about gold standards and stuff like that. I've heard it, and you know, makes sense. You know, I can't confirm yeah, yeah, those yeah. conspiracy so, theories, but yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the gold standard, when the U.S. moved off of the gold standard and the U.S. dollar moved to being based on nothing anymore, just basically confidence. It's based on confidence. Yeah, confidence. Um, that That's legitimate. That is actually yeah. what happened. Um, but I think that's why it's so much more important for the U.S. to not use the U.S. dollar as a weapon, because then it gives other people an incentive to want to create an alternative. When European banks are being sued by the U.S., uh, simply because they made a settlement in U.S. dollars, it's it's really they're shooting themselves in the foot. Um, cur currency and um, currency and Bitcoin and all this kind of stuff, decentralized currency, is something I'm very interested in. So if I'm no, totally, random, yeah, <laughs> totally, man. I mean, for a while, I think blockchain channels, like channels talking about blockchain, were blowing up, and I think YouTube put a lid to it because, you know, for various reasons. But I remember in 2017. 2018 like blockchain channels were blowing up like crazy yeah you know what uh, the thing is with blockchain there's a lot of scammers there's a lot of yeah. scammers in blockchain also creating all these icos and these bullshit products but bitcoin itself uh, you know it was created in 2008 during the financial crisis when people lost confidence in the financial system and mm -hmm. bitcoin was made for events like this that we're going through now where all of a sudden there's indiscriminate printing of money and, and all of a sudden there's a hyperinflation and negative interest rates. This is what Bitcoin was made for. And I think there's a lot more institutions uh, um, uh, paying attention now. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, this I'm, I'm seeing other people. I, I think I got a lot of, I'm really proud of some of the people who are in my chat because they know, they know what's on. They're talking about, you know, fiat currency will always go back to its original value, which is the paper they printed on. Or I, I got to add to that, uh, uh, Stephen, or it goes to even less than paper value. Because if you look at, um, I think it was in uh, Venezuela where the, the, it was cheaper to buy, it was cheaper to use paper currency as wallpaper than it was to actually use wallpaper. 
So, you know, if you wanted to wallpaper your wall, you're better off just using money because it's worth less than the wallpaper you could buy with it. Yeah. I think <laughs> you know? it happened in Zimbabwe too when they had hyperinflation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there was a uh, there was a story of a, a Zimbabwean guy uh, walking down the street with a wheelbarrow of cash. Yeah, yeah. And uh, somebody saw that, and they're like, "Aren't you aren't you afraid somebody's gonna steal that cash?" And uh, he says, "No, I'm af I'd be more afraid if somebody wanted to steal the wheelbarrow." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, it's, a world, risk, man. it's a risk. It's a risk. Associating value with something, whether it's a U.S. dollar or whether it was way back when we decided that gold, this shiny metal, was going to have value, is based on uh, people having a common agreement and a common understanding that this is what we're going to uh, put our confidence in in terms of a currency. Yeah. And so all it takes is people to say, you know what, we're going to put our, our confidence in Bitcoin. It's decentralized. There's no one government that is controlling it. It has a fixed inflation rate. You know there's only going to be 22 million Bitcoins ever printed. There's never going to be any more than that. It's completely transparent. Um, that, to me, sounds like um, something that people could put their confidence behind. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes. That's my, yeah. <laughs> that's my take on it. Dude, it's so uh, interesting thinking about all currency in some ways based on confidence. Like you said, what if one day people are just like, you know, people try to justify gold like being you know oh it's rare it's good it's the perfect conductor you know they give it all these like things right but yeah, then it's like yeah. what if people are just like well who gives an f i don't care i don't care that it's a good conductor i don't care that it's rare yeah i can't no, it's, gold, it's right? about the, yeah to, to assign it as a currency to assign it as a as a store of value that is nothing uh, more than just a social uh social construct yeah like and, uh, an example i can think of is jade chinese people love jade but in america jade's just like oh it's just a cool rock that you can carve into things like people in america don't associate jade with as high quality like fake sweet right that type of jade from burma and like yunnan and stuff like people in america were like oh yeah it's, it's just a rock but like people in china are like well fake sweet you know it, it can like absorb your toxicity and stuff like that right <laughs> so like you see that's like an example of subjective value yeah yeah yeah. jade yeah. is so jaded since u.s uncensored <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah. But uh, oh, yeah, like so. When you think about psychology like that, maybe one day the world will embrace Bitcoin. Wow, that's I, you know what? I, you know, honestly, I never thought about that, but that's why I like these discussions, man. It gets me to think. We're, we're in a digital era. We are so much of our lives are on the internet. We are we are an advanced uh, uh, technological society. It only makes sense that uh, the evolution of uh, currency will take a digital form. And of course, we have a digital form of our pre-existing uh, currencies where you can use Apple Pay and you can use WeChat, which is based on a, on a fiat currency, based on a government currency. But I'm saying taking it one step further where the currency itself is decoupled from any government and it is a true internet currency. I, I, think, I think that's what we're going to move towards. I think that's what we're going to have. Or, and we should at least uh, have that. So you're not at the mercy of any specific administration around the world who happens to have the dominant currency at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this type of thought isn't new. F.A. Hayek, right? Libertarians love him. Certain conservatives love him, too. But F.A. Hayek, at, at the end of his life, I think, you know, he really thought about monetary policies. Like, what can we do? And one of his ideas was... If we can't do the gold standard, then have competing currencies. Exactly like you said. That way, you know, he wasn't thinking internationally. He was just thinking like America. He's like that way. At least one bank can't just like you know, you have Absolutely. banks competing. Absolutely. But if you put this in the international scale, you know, you have competing bitcoins and everything. Nothing's on a whim of some corporation. Nothing's on a whim of some government's thoughts. Absolutely, because you don't know what the inflation of the U.S. dollar will be tomorrow. You don't know tomorrow what this particular administration or the next administration is going to decide on how much money to print. You don't know. You, you just have to trust that they're not going to overdo it. Yeah. With a, a currency like Bitcoin, a digital currency, you, you know, you know up front, this is the inflation rate. This is how quickly it's going to inflate and it will never exceed 22 million Bitcoins. Exactly. I mean, it's you, you need something like that, that you don't have to just put your faith in whatever government is in power in that particular time. Exactly. But, um, yeah. And with that I, being I, said, I'm going to get some water. So I'm going to take yeah. my break. I'll be right back. Oh, oh, I've got to do the entertaining now. The problem is, is I don't have, when, when Jerry left, he did some entertaining with some nunchucks and uh, some juggling and stuff like that. But I have, um, I have no skills. So 
<laughs> I could pour a beer. I could show you guys I could pour a beer. <laughs> but that would re require me moving the laptop. Let me let me take this opportunity while he's gone to uh, to look through some of the comments here. A lot of you guys, I think a lot of my guys are understand the Bitcoin. You know, I'm seeing them even use the BTC uh, abbreviation. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of people who uh, really appreciate the um, the concerns with uh, global fiat currencies right now. You uh, can you can you do some entertaining for five seconds while I just do a refill? Sure, sure. Hey guys, for those of you tuning in, this is Jerry, and I'm talking with Daniel. And um, Daniel and I have been wanting to talk for a while, so it's good that this finally happened. You know, we've all been so busy. I have a lot of other channels I run, so um, a lot of you probably know me from 2018 um the algorithm really liked me and then unfortunately you know i understand i explore a lot of issues that kind of aren't accepted by the mainstream so my channel unfortunately doesn't appear in many people's recommendations anymore which is fine gives there's always opportunity in any situations like this so um shout out to all the viewers that came over from daniel's channel and anyone that's on my channel please go to daniel's channel too. visit his chat section talk a little too so Somebody mentioned the petrodollar too. Yeah, that was something um, that was, uh, yeah, what's going to be oil back to currency. Mm -hmm. um, there was some backlash from the US against that also, um, if I remember correctly. But mm -hmm. uh, you know what? Can you post uh, Can you post your channel name uh, in the comments? And then I'm going to put it up on the screen. Some people are asking. Yeah, sure. Um, let me see. I'll, I'll put this up. Uh, Jimmy Crack Corn, you are uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it, some people refer to it as a digital currency, but it is uh, a lot of people call it an asset or a store of value. I, I totally agree. I think things will change where um, people will potentially use it as a, a currency with second layer solutions, but we'll see. Anyways, this is not a, okay, I'm going to put, this is Jerry's channel for everybody. I've got, I've got 314 people uh, live on my channel. So if you guys want to follow Jerry, he's over there. And then on your YouTube channel, can they link through? Can they find your other channels and stuff like that? The other um, yeah, um, I, I tend to keep my martial arts channel separate, but all yeah. my other channels where it's like I'm on camera, uh, you can you can find it on on my Jerry channel. The reason I keep my martial arts channel separate is one, it's it's like a it's like my big thing, but also most people don't know my face, so I like keeping it a mystery. It's always funny when people are like. Jerry, man, I thought you were a white fat dude. I'm like, nope. No, that's why you don't judge, man. That's why you don't judge by the voice. So, you do kind of sound like a white fat dude, actually. I yeah. do. I do. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Proud of it. That's a pretty good, big, big surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my, like, I, nobody would guess that I look like this also when I, uh, you know, they'd say, oh, you're brown. You know, I thought you were going to be some white uh, American or Canadian dude. Um, <laughs> My last, I did an interview this morning with uh, uh, a British guy from Hong Kong. He's mm -hmm. a uh, he's an expat living in Hong Kong who went out with the protesters. He supported the protesters and stuff like that. And he moved a little bit more towards the middle ground. And he created an interesting group called the Green Group, which is a, a mix between the yellow and the and the blue camps. And when you mix yellow and blue, you get green, right? So uh, mm -hmm. and he's like more middle ground where he's not like pro protesters, but he's also not pro China. Um, and he just wants to have some rational conversation in the middle. But he 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 made the assumption that I was American right off the bat. He's like, you know, you're American. I said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not American. But um, my Canadian accent only comes out when I'm speaking to Canadians. You know, I did a I did a live stream. There's one. Uh, there's well, there's a couple Canadians on there, and uh, one of them has a real thick Canadian accent. When he starts going, oh, my Canadian accent starts coming out, eh? <laughs> then you really know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But um, do you ever go back to um, Canada still, or do you mostly stay in I, China now? So I used to go every year, and then now it's like every three years or something like that. I've been back in a while. We've got like, we've got, well, I've got four kids. I've got four boys. Uh, wow. So when we go back, we pretty much got to charter a plane. It's yeah. like, uh, it's a big trip. Uh, the last big trip I did with them is uh, to my brother's wedding in Europe. And uh, so we went to Greece. We did a big trip. We did. A, we went to where you go. We went to Italy. We went to Greece. We went to Amsterdam, uh, Germany, a uh, bunch of places with the kids, uh, and then to Canada. That was the last time we were in Canada. That was like three years ago or something like that. 
Uh, for this year, I don't, I don't, you know, with everything going on, we're obviously not going to be uh, traveling anytime soon. Yeah. And what we'll probably do is now that China's back to normal, um, we're probably going to get an RV. We're probably going to get an RV and do some traveling in China because there's a nice. lot of amazing places. In um, in the summer, they have a RV uh, tour tour group um, who are going to drive from all over China to Xinjiang. And we're going to drive through Xinjiang. So that's going to be, I'm really looking forward to that. There's so many places. I've been to Tibet and I've done some hiking through Tibet. Um, but Xinjiang, I was so close to the border, but I, I haven't been yet. And I really, really want to go. The, my, the only things I know about Xinjiang are from my um, uh, Uyghur friends here in Shenzhen or uh, uh, Han Chinese friends who were born in uh, Xinjiang. Um, but that's going to be a spectacular trip. So much culture. The food is amazing. Um, and if we do it in an RV, it'll be even better. Wow. Yeah. If you do, I'm excited. I'm excited to see the videos because it'll be better than those two guys riding motorcycles. To, to oh, yeah. There, there, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. They, um, yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't get them. Um, yeah. It's just, it's too extreme. There's no yeah. balance at all. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I, I know them personally. I know them. Oh, personally. you do? That's hilarious. I do. They've, they've been here. Um, actually, the the main guy. I don't want to use their names, but the main guy with the larger following. Mm -hmm. um, I've been I've been friend I've been friends with him for years. And so when I started calling them out, um, he was really upset with me. And uh, we had some debates in um, in, in uh, by WeChat. I don't want to I don't want to reveal exactly what we said, but he was really upset with me. Um, and he called me a coward and stuff like that. Oh, now I'm revealing mm -hmm. some of the stuff he said. And mm -hmm. I said to him, I said, you know, man, there are a lot of other expats in Shenzhen who know him, who really find what he does completely distasteful. And they sign up for an anonymous profile name and they go on the internet and then they say, they bat, they kind of bash them. They say, you guys are ignorant or you, you know, this is such bullshit. You didn't see this. You didn't, that, that's a complete lie. I'm here using my actual name. I'm using my real name. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me to call them out because I know them personally. I've met them, but I just think they've gone so far overboard. They've gone too extreme that it would be actually um, irresponsible of me to to not call them out. If I was to give them a pass just because they're my friends, just because of I knew I knew them before, when I can call them out with, uh, uh, I feel like I could do a good job calling out what they do and exposing the issues with what they do. That would be a tragedy. That would be a, a being a coward. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's funny because well, you know when I made that video and I, I gave you support, a, a lot of like I see like I love LA, right? I'm not going to say there's not bad things about LA, but a lot of people who come to LA don't like it, and it's really funny because LA is one of these places. If you don't find the right community, you don't find the right place for you, it can suck pretty bad for you. Right. And that's the thing. And that's why it goes back to what we talked about earlier. When you go somewhere, you got to figure out how to like get the lay of the land, got to figure out how to really integrate. Right. You, you got to figure that out. You can't just like uh, expect things to come to you. You can't just expect, oh, I'm going to stick to the same routine and like, you know, I'm just going to have it all good. Like that, that, that's like that's rule number one when you move somewhere. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic. But yeah, uh, exactly. I, I got a, I got a question from uh, Arthur Larson again. Um, so I was talking about they have a huge um, I don't know if you know, it's like towards the Inner Mongolia area. There's a big party. It's like the biggest outdoor party in the world where all kinds of RVs and all kinds of people gather like over a million people, something like that. And they have music and they have things like that. It's like China's version of Burning Man almost. Oh. Uh, and so I was asked the question if it's canceled this year because of what's going on. I'm not sure, actually. I haven't checked. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually thinking of uh, doing something where you, you, you need to know the right people to do this. What I was going to do is I was going to get a 20-foot container, and I was going to convert it into a – well, actually, no. You can get 20-foot containers, which are uh, cooled containers that are meant for, like, shipping food overseas and stuff like that. So I got a cooled container, and I was going to open up holes in the side with taps on them, and then put beer in there and take beer and sell beer at this uh, event from the Ooh. side of a, this truck. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> yeah, that's going to that's gonna make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, because nobody else is selling fresh yeah. craft beer. I think they've got like the cheap bottled beer, like Qingdao and stuff like that. 
Um, but this year, I wouldn't be surprised if it is canceled, especially with the kinds of numbers of people mm. uh, that gather in that event um, and how jam-packed it is. Yeah, exactly. But, I've always been curious about this, Daniel. Um, what made you decide to open up a brew pub? So um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a craft beer fan uh, myself. I really like craft beer. Um, there wasn't really a lot of choice for good craft beer in Shenzhen to begin with. And so it was kind of like a side project that was a hobby. I didn't know if it was really going to make money or anything like that. Um, but I did it just because I thought it would be a cool project and a cool hangout place. And I I'm so glad uh, I did because I've met so many interesting people here. I've met so many good friends here um, that it's been worth it just for that. Um, you know, and, and, and that's what I wanted to create. You know, this uh, – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can uh, – move the laptop around to show you. Mm, nice. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like open concept, right? It's like you come mm -hmm. in and you've got uh, these middle tables here, um, which, which people can kind of stand around. Um, and then you've got this, these tables here. So it's really, really open concept. So mm -hmm. this is the kind of place where a lot of people make new friends here. Uh, not only myself, Hold on, let me got to plug my laptop. Back. Mm -hmm. um, nice. So, it accomplished everything I wanted to kind of a hangout place, a cool project, uh, you know, a place to drink fresh, uh, craft beer. Uh, that's, that was my motivation. Now, um, I did, I, I opened up additional. So this, this one is owned hundred percent by myself. The brand is mine. I had a partnership with, uh, with some guys uh, to open up uh, some pretty big locations, which I spent a lot of time building and designing. Mm -hmm. And that was a business uh, relationship, a partnership that fell apart. Um, the, uh, the business partner ended up being a pretty crappy guy. Um, and that's the story I haven't told yet. Mm. But after that, I was like, um, I, I mean that location, let me, I mean, this is, this is a small neighborhood shop, but the one, the other one I opened was in uh, a place called Coco park. It's kind of like the central business district area of Shenzhen. And we were pulling in like revenue. We were pulling in like 2 million renminbi a month, like 300,000. That's like 300,000 US dollars. And it was like, all right, you know what? Now this has changed from a hobby to something that actually could make a pretty good living. Um, but when the partner saw how much money was coming in, I was a 60% owner and he was a 40% owner. You know, the greed took over and, you know, things fell apart. He took it, he took it over and, uh, he turned it into a piece of crap and now it's like pretty much gone he, mm. even after he, he tried to take it over himself because he thought it was easy he thought okay i've done all the hard work i built it and everything like that um and you get these stories all over the world with uh with um um you know business dealings going bad or getting involved with the wrong people yeah. um, now there's a couple of guys who are opening up franchise shops they're opening up lots of little shops little neighborhood shops which have the same feel as this it's a place um, you know, nobody here has big homes, so they're not going to have a really good common area in their home where they can invite friends over. So having a really kind of neighborhoody place downstairs where you can go down um, and hang out with your friends is what the goal is of a lot of these new smaller shops. And uh, so they're opening a lot more of them, and I'm quite flexible with them. They're pretty much just uh, buying the uh, 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 buying the beer for me. They're using my brand name. I've signed something that they're allowed to use my brand name. Nice. And so that might turn into, that might create this into something bigger. But honestly, if this just stays as a little kind of a cool side project, which I enjoy, a, a nice place to meet people, I'm already happy with that. Yeah. 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 Wow. I'm, I'm so excited for you, man. I'm, I'm so glad you made it work in China. It's, you know, it, like, um, I made it work in LA, right? I had no family in LA. So that's different from going all the way to China to a different culture. But I totally can, in an analogous way, get how it feels to like completely go somewhere different and just build something. Yeah. I mean, no matter where you go, whether it's, you know, the next city over or the next country over, I mean, going somewhere where you don't know anybody and you got to start new, it's, it's, uh, it's, that's a big thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, adding in the completely different culture is a whole different, um, uh, uh, element as well, but that's not something I would look at as a as a barrier for me. That's something that makes even more exciting for me. 
that there's yeah. a chance to just learn something so different. And I think a lot of people who come over to China, they've got to look at it the same way. They don't got to come over here and say, let me see how good China is. Let me see how bad China is. Because as soon as you're saying that, you're using, you're coming with your pre-existing framework and you're not willing to, you, you've already admitted you're not going to change your framework. What yeah. is good is good. What is bad is bad. You've already decided that you're the arbiter of that word. Yeah. And this is where, uh, this is the mistake that a lot of these people make who end up going back and just shitting on China all day long in their, you know, content. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If, yeah. if you just, like you said, just like um, take out all biases, like, you know, I, I, went, I moved to LA in 2012 for a summer just to check it out. And back then I was like, oh, I want to see how good it is. Right. And then I, I, I was like, that was already biased. Right. And then in 2014, I went to LA for a little bit. And again, I was like, okay, um, I already, I had another bias. And then eventually 2015, when I moved here for good, I'm like, let's just not have a bias. Let's just like make it work here. <laughs> and then, you know, and people were like, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to make friends in LA, which is true. But I've met some of my closest friends in LA, you know, and most people are like, yeah, you make your closest friends in middle school, or you make your closest friends in college, or whatever. I made my closest friends here in LA. So like, because I came with this mentality, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm just going to make it work. I'm not going to like have this skew or that skew or whatever. And I think for people who want to go to China, it's the same thing. You know, try, try your best. I know it's hard. Try your best to not think like, oh, it's red China. It's this. Oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, the Chinese school, oh, they'll flock over. No, don't think like that. Just be like, I'm yeah. just going to a new city. I'm going to make it work. Yeah, I, I guess the I guess the ideal situation will be is like, you know, people talk about like integration and, uh, 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 you know, stuff like that. And th that's an important piece is becoming integrated enough where you at least understand society, but still holding on to whatever it is you brought from wherever you came. Because, you know, you don't just need you're not expected to just completely switch to be an exact copy of the people and the new neighborhood you're in or whatever it is. And I think that's an important part Um that people should remember to hold on to as well. Yeah. So, um, uh, you, you know, th that's an advantage you have over your neighbors. If you're living around other people in LA who's never really lived outside of LA, uh, that's an advantage that you should hold on to. That you're not necessarily going to completely integrate and take on all of their habits and all these things. And uh, um, you just become more dynamic and you become more global thinking, really. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There, there, there's so many differences in the. Uh, in, in cultural standards also, you know, so here in China, people don't really get like road rage like you have in the West. Mm -hmm. You have incidents of road rage, but it's not as common. You know, I remember, I can't remember which comedian it was. Uh, they were talking about how weird road rage is in the West. And he was, he was a guy from the West and he was talking about, it's like, you know, when you're in, in the traffic and somebody cuts you off or something like that, you're so willing to like, you know, put your middle finger up at them and say, Oh, fuck you. And stuff like that. And it's like, but we're like, that's another human. You, that's another human being driving that car. It's like, if you were in the elevator and somebody bumped into you in the elevator, would you put your middle finger up in their face and say, fuck you, you know, get out of my face. No, it's because you have this, you know, barrier of these cars and it's like a little bit more disconnected, but you don't get that as much here. And it's a weird thing. So I remember when I took my wife for the first time to the U S we did a big road trip from uh, uh, Santa Cruz all the way up to Vancouver. Uh, we went along the coast. We went through the uh, Redwood uh, Redwood Forest or Pine, whatever they're called. We saw the sand dunes in um, in, in Oregon, and then we crop, we went to uh, Astoria to see the house where the Goonies was filmed, and then and then crossed over the bridge to Washington State, and then up to Vancouver, and then north northern BC. But while we were while we were in San Diego, I remember. There was a guy, we needed to get off at uh, an exit. Uh, and I was, I had my indicator on, I wanted to cross over. And this guy like completely cut me off where I could like, I almost completely missed the exit. I still managed to go. And then there was a guy who pulled up behind in a, in a pickup truck. And then he pulled up to the guy beside me and he started swearing at him and yelling at him. And my wife was like, Cause we weren't angry. It's like, whatever we got cut off. Like I got used to the Chinese way. It's like, whatever it happens. And she's like, why is that guy angry at him? And it's like, and he's like, Oh, because he cut, he cut me off. And then I was like, um, and then, and, oh, nice. Coming. And <laughs> or then not I was nice, like, maybe, you know, somebody, somebody's coming in. I don't think they know we're closed right now. Um, but after I got cut off, um, 
he was yelling at him. He's like, why is he angry? And I was like, because uh, that guy in front cut us off. And he's like, yeah, but it's got nothing to do with him. And it's like, that was the level of road rage where somebody's even going to get angry on your behalf. And it was just this foreign idea. Oh, wow. 我们六点会开。六点,对,六点会开。现在,如果再过那个十分钟,会有一个人,等一下我可以叫他过来。你要打包吗? 有自己的啤酒对自己酿的你是要如果你那个六点六点过来是会好一点对我在这里很久我现在在录一个箱我在一个做一个跟一个人做直播但是如果现在要打包吗还是 Oh, hi. I can give me one second. Yeah, sure. Do your thing. Take care of her. Take care of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will do some more nunchucks or something. That's okay. Um, if you want to take a, like a takeaway, I can help you do a takeaway. Do you like like IPAs and stuff like that, or or? I can uh I can give you a little bit to go and then uh six o'clock we open. Ah, okay, yeah. So this is gonna be a little bit more I'm gonna be going. Yeah. At six o'clock we'll be open and they'll have all the glasses open and stuff like that. Uh give me a free. For those of you watching, uh Daniel's taking care of a customer real quickly, so I'm just gonna mess around. While he takes care of the customer. This one is at number 12, so it's an end of day's IPA. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a uh, I'm doing a live stream with a YouTuber from uh, from California. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> live, live on YouTube. <laughs> Actually, while we're at it, guys, um, I might as well give you guys a little public PSA. So a lot of us under this lockdown, we're kind of looking down at our phones. So a lot of us are developing a lot of muscle and balance. So what I recommend you guys do is so keep your chin the same angle, right? And then do what are called chin tucks. Check this out. So you go. See that? Um, these are called um, chin tucks. And what they do is they develop these muscles back here. Because what happens is when you're looking down at your phone, you know, you're doing this. There's certain muscles, especially they're getting worked out too much, and there's other muscles that are getting weak. So one of the first things to do is just practice tucking your chin, but keep the angles. Don't tuck down. Tuck. Think like this plane. So tuck your chin. So this, these are called chin tucks. So do like 10 of them a day and do it like um, three times a day or that way. Develop some of these muscles that are weak. I'm Daniel telling viewers about chin tucks and stuff like that because a lot of our muscles are imbalanced because we're always on the phone, especially under a lockdown, we're on the computers and stuff like this. Yeah, so seriously. I'm telling people to do chin tucks because, you know, I, I was a pretty big nerd in high school. So I had pretty bad for head posture, even in college and stuff. So, you know, I've been I've been trying to make my neck stronger because yeah. You know, if, if your neck is imbalanced, you, you get hurt much more easily and stuff like that. And you know, just you're asking for a lot of potential problems in the future when you get older. So make sure look up chin glides or chin tucks for all viewers watching. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good point. I mean, that's what we're going to be doing at home, right? We're going to be on our technology. That's how we're going to be con connecting to the world. Um is through um, is through all these devices, and that's I I've, I've had to I've had to keep myself in check too. I've been I've been using my phone way too much during a lockdown mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, and uh, um, in general, um, if you guys have to do one exercise under lockdown, do exercises that work out your upper back because a lot of us have weak upper backs. Because first of all, it's, it's muscles we don't see, right? So when we look at the mirror, we can't tell that we have weak upper backs. But also by looking down, you know, by over 